This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Okay. And we're back with a film Friday day. Friday day. Yeah, we uh yeah. <laughs> we we flopped yesterday. We didn't uh, we couldn't quite get in front of the mic. Nope. It just didn't happen. So didn't. here we are with a with a film Saturday. Not our usual <laughs> film Friday. <laughs> usual film Friday. But we're, we're back- stoked about this one though. Like it's not like we uh yeah, put it off by any means. No, it was, no, no. Uh, it's it's probably the most complicated film we've covered on the show to date it's funny because we've mentioned that quite a few bits where we're just like oh it's a mind bender and uh yeah this I say that takes a lot. the cake i would say yeah so we are talking about none other than primer 2004 film written directed starring and basically every other credit can go to shane carruth this is his baby indie film um i want to read out quickly here i i was curious about why he chose the name primer for his film And so, obviously, looking up a few definitions. There was two that I came up with. Um, The second was the most interesting, though, and I think is the most relevant to this film in particular. Definitely. And so that would be the definition that primer is a cap or cylinder containing a compound which responds to friction or an electrical impulse and ignites the charge in a cartridge or explosive. End quote. So I thought that was really cool. Like, what do you immediately think of when you hear that? Um, I mean... I guess, like, I'm, well, first and foremost, I mean, I am certainly not a scientist by any means. So I, <laughs> I I feel like the first thing that pops to my mind when I hear the word primer in that first part, a cap or cylinder, I think like a car and en- I think an engine of some kind. Oh. But I mean, as you read on, obviously, like, you, yeah, I mean, this says a lot about what's I'm going thinking on. more like metaphorically speaking like themes of the show how this could possibly relate it into that and like i i think this is really telling Mm -hmm. i think that the idea of like a cap or a cylinder that contains a compound because we get this element right of this film where they're essentially contained inside a it's not a cylinder but it's a container container. and i feel as though this in a metaphorical sense not in a literal sense of the word actually is this sort of basis or foundation that is the spark that ignites something that they don't even know that they've started okay, right you very so much that's so. kind of what i'm thinking it's, yeah, it's I'm an explosion or spark in to a new beginning kind of thing i just thought that was really cool though definitely yeah i'm digging on that yeah well i think that makes total sense that's probably why i chose it absolutely not not just the uh the uh, relation to the device itself but mm-hmm, let's um mm-hmm. let's give it a little breakdown though Oh, wait, did you want me to mention the budget, though, first? I suppose I should. Um, go for it. Because this is actually really interesting. I didn't really do any, like, hard, hard digging into this, but I came across a couple different references. When we say indie film people, we mean indie film. And, like, we obviously hope you you guys have all watched it. And hopefully maybe more than once, because you probably need to. You're going to need to. But um, this movie was made for less than 10 grand, from by all accounts. Here. That's crazy. I saw one article that said less than 20, but less than 10? Even less than 20 insane. is like for a movie that ends up at Sundance and does well at Sundance. I believe that was the festival it went to. But anyway, it's just pretty um, impressive. It was at yeah. one of those ones. One of the one of the bigger name festivals. I don't know if it was Sundance, but I think it started with Sun. Okay. But I could have that Anyway, it went to some (laughs) film festival and it kind of caught everybody off guard. Yeah, I I have seen a lot that basically was like, no one really expected much of this and it's very unassuming. Everything about it is unassuming, right? Like the style, the filmography, the characters themselves, the dialogue, everything is just almost like voyeuristic filmography where it's like you are a fly on the wall. Nothing about this movie is tailored to a general audience. 
None of it. No. And I read through several sources saying that, like, Carruth was, uh, he had a lot of faith in the project, and he believed that people would go back again and again to get what they wanted out of it. And I think he's right. Absolutely. I think it's been highly successful, even though it obviously wasn't very commercially successful, I guess, but on a more culty sort of indie level, I feel like this is definitely one of those ones that's like a hallmark or something like that. Absolutely, definitely. And like we probably mentioned right off the bat, the most complicated time <laughs> travel movie we've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, we had to do some research and we didn't have to do that after, I mean, well, many of the other movies we've watched, really. We've just sort of speculated <laughs> oh, on them. no, The Ruins! That one was so deep. We well. needed to research the shit out of that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you're going back to that. You're really hating on that again. I'm not hating on we've it. Already. I'm just saying it was pretty simple. Just salt in the wound, salt in the wound. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the plot breakdown here, because okay, we're not going to focus too heavily on this. I feel as though if you get too bogged down in the nuances of what is the plot of this movie, you are going to just get lost. And different people have different takes on this. I've watched a several different, like, explanation videos slash, like, people's interpretations, yeah. like, uh, online. And some people will really, really, really just like strip away everything other than say Aaron and Abe from the plot. Other people will be more inclusive. Um, there was one from this British chick that I watched. It was like freaking half an hour long. And she just kind of, she included everyone. She included the guy that Aaron and Abe wanted to punch. She included the the dad that supposedly, he, he became comatose because he used the machine incorrectly maybe. We didn't even get a real explanation as to what yeah. occurred for him. No, he was don't. obviously trying to save his daughter is kind of the implication there. And we have a dog. We have a bulldog that's snoring in the background right now. I'm just going to get up, everybody. And, All right. Uh, well, I'm just going to get into the uh, plot while you're doing that. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah, like we said, we're not going to get too bogged down. But essentially, we're following two, uh, quote-unquote, friends, Aaron and Abe, who inadvertently invented time travel, which is pretty crazy. But they weren't even trying to do that. Uh, you kind of piece <laughs> together through the conversations they have with their other two colleagues that they have actually try to go about inventing a way to either lessen mass or create an anti-gravity machine. So they're trying to block the effects of gravity. And yeah. we had subtle references like I, I caught because like I don't have a scientist mind by any means. And so the terminology, a lot of it is beyond me. But I caught references to like, say, like, um, oh, what was it called? Not super conducting, but conducting in different temperatures and different materials and like helium they were talking about and all this stuff. And I was like, that reminds me of when we were researching Ed Leeds Skeldon and like anti-gravity devices and all this kind of stuff. Levitation and, and all this. Exactly. Thing. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was some parallels for sure. It's funny like, that you wrote this down here, like in, inadvertent, it's pretty, that's pretty wild to inadvertently discover a time travel, a means of time travel. Yeah. I, I guess the um, reasoning behind their like initial you know, Endeavor was to probably have like, you know, they're, they, they're, they're very much like business oriented type guys. Like they're very they're trying to make money. They're trying to make money. And you'd think there'd be like some sort of commercial application in maybe the aviation industry or something like that to make it lighter to fly a plane or mm -hmm. something like this. That's kind of like what they're going for. And yeah. they end up with the total opposite in a, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of, uh, well, I mean, yeah. And then it's interesting because they, they you do get reference from the narrator, which ends up being like Aaron too or whatever. And he mentions, he's like, they knew there was value in the device. They knew there was money involved, but how? And they end up not going about it in a very uh, traditional capitalist way. They just go about doing their own, like, you know, money making schemes where they're essentially just, yeah, making money off stocks. Well, because that's Play was in the, the market. only real thing they could do, they realized. There wasn't a commercial application for it, really. And that's why, because they do make this, there's this one scene where they mention, they're like, we can publish, we can publish. But then Abe kind of makes a comment and then they say like, I think they strayed away from that. I don't even think they ended up publishing anything. No. In the end. No, I don't think they did. if they, they did, then the complications that would arise from that would probably be... Devastating. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. Okay, okay, so yeah, so they invent this travel, this time traveling device. For me, because it's so vague, right, what they're actually even accomplishing, and they don't even know, right, for a little bit. And there's this one scene where they discover that it's creating this protein. And initially, they think that this protein might be 
the way to make money off this thing. Cause they don't even know what it's really doing, No, but they know that it's creating this massive amount of protein <clears throat> that usually takes what, about a month to produce. <clears throat> They're producing massive quantities of it in like less than three days. Yeah. They go see like a fungus expert or something. Right. And the only real application for it would to be, would be for, yeah, I believe it was for like for that, for growing fungus at a more rapid rate. Or something, something along or, those lines. Or something I don't like think that. it was fungus. It was the specific protein. I can't remember what the application was. But anyways, that's again, right? That's a side sort of side narrative. And if you get too bogged down in these, then you kind of lose sight of what's going on. And it's so easy, right? Because there's so much of this movie that isn't shown. <clears throat> and you kind of have to pick up on the cues through the dialogue and the sort of developments that are happening sort of behind the scenes that you get through the dialogue. Okay? Yeah. And this is why you have to watch it more than once because yes. not only is there things that are way off the second time in terms of just the conversation in general, but the inflection in mm-hmm. the conversations, like the way Aaron goes about his, yes, uh, right. You, exactly. you, you notice things differently. You do definitely. And even Abe too, right? I think one of the main words a thematic word I would use for this movie is duplicity. Everyone is very, uh, oh, what's the word? They're very, not, I'm using the word nefarious now. They're very, yeah, duplicitous and very conniving to a certain degree slash untrusting. And they, it's almost like layer upon layer upon layer of deceit that you sort of begin to unravel as the narrative progresses. And by like literally the first time I watched the movie by then, I was like, what just happened? Oh yeah. The <laughs> like, first time you, you really don't <laughs> Yeah, You're like, I need to like rewind this whole thing and just yeah. go watch it. Yeah. Which is exactly his intention. <laughs> Shane's exactly. intention. And uh, totally. it does such a great job of that. Right. He really does. Cause in the end, like close to the end, actually not at the end, but close to the end, it's like, I make this point further along in our notes here, but I just, it's almost as if they are hopscotching over each other and that they're simultaneously one step ahead and behind of each other at the same time. Yeah. And that's where you kind of get this complication of this A-B loop. And as soon as my brain starts to think about it, my brain starts to just like turn into goo. (laughs) It's just like... (laughs) The goo. Because there is a few instances of paradoxes in this film that they bring up. Yeah. One is the cell phone call. Yes. And this the, the 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 whole idea that there's these doubles walking around. That's effed up. It's very very it's strange. So effed up. But Kay. that. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, sorry. I'm sorry. I go, can't, go, I'm go. cutting you off. No. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to like kind of break this down a little bit for uh, you know for those who haven't watched the movie yet. Oh, maybe. God. I mean, you got to go watch you it. You have to yet. watch it. But I mean, okay. So this is kind of the layman's terms breakdown of mm. how the act- how this process actually kind of goes. Okay. Just right. for frame of reference here. <laughs> so. The bo- so it, these it's not a time machine in the sense that you can get it in and go back to the Stone Age, okay? The time machine only functions um, from the date of its existence, essentially, right? That's interesting. So from the time you turn it on, exactly. you have to leave it turned on. So, so basically, yeah, so it's got to be switched on from the time you want to travel back to. So there's essentially a connection in a sort of loop. Yeah, and they so you talk can't go about back this, any further. Exactly, and they talk about this loop before they know what's going on. When they're in their process of trying to, you know, create the anti-gravity or whatever, they realize when it sort of works that first time, yes. they're like, oh, it just continues on the loop. Exactly. They have like a widget or something yeah. in the track. And that's when they decide to build the bigger box to contain a human. Exactly, right? So, yeah, so we get this reference to a loop really early on. So if it's Tuesday and you wanted to travel back to Monday morning at 9 a.m., which is the time that we're working with for the actual story, because this is what they do to play the stock market, Mm -hmm. you would have needed to turn the box on at on Monday morning at 9 a.m., priming the machine. You could Mm. use that. It works in in that as well. I like that. Yeah. For the loop, right? So you're priming the machine for this loop back from your current point in time to Monday at 8 a.m. Right. Or or 9 a.m. So that's, that's essentially how it works. But the problem right. is that their move, their, <laughs> well, he's going to, he, he goes and hides out in a hotel. While it's priming. While it's priming. So this is where we get the first instance of there's two Abes existing at the same time. Aaron doesn't know about it yet. And once he goes into the machine. Once he goes into the machine. And here we can inevitably see the domino effect problem that this movie ends up dealing with here Mm -hmm. where there's multiple where they're existing at the same time as themselves going through this priming process exactly which causes a lot of problems which 
honestly confused the shit out of me when I was first trying to comprehend what was going on because in my mind I was like, hey, wait a second, if they're getting this weird protein buildup, are they literally producing physical replicas of themselves? Like I didn't quite understand the whole AB loop thing at first. And then I kind of started to realize that, yeah, exactly that. So you would prime the machine and then while the machine is priming, you honestly have to be out of the way, right? Because you can't influence anything that'll happen along that trajectory while, because then you're going to F with everything potentially, and right? That's what they think. That's what they were thinking because they're trying to eliminate all, they're being scientists, right? They're trying yes. to eliminate all variables that they possibly can. And so that's what they do to yeah. eliminate that is to go hide in the hotel and then go to the machine and repeat the loop. And so that to me was, again, like, how are you not getting infinite infinite Abe's and infinite Aaron's here. Like, I don't I know, understand. Right? Well, here, and here's the other part of it too, people. So it's like, okay, so the original Aaron and Abe, they go through the machine, right? Then there's, now there's two existing Aaron and Abe's at the same time. They go on and watch the market, right? Mm -hmm. Air, the original Aaron and Abe are hiding out in this hotel mm -hmm. as the, the other ones are watching the market. Then at the end of the day, they, the ones from the hotel they go back in the box and go back in time while the others continue to live yeah. in their timeline. They're almost in their own little infinite loop. Right? And then they know what happened the day, that day, and mm -hmm. then they play the market. Yeah. So it's so weird. You hold yourself in a hotel all day, and then you just you go back in time. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, yourself just gets to continue along the same timeline, knowing what the other self is doing in the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre. Exactly. And that's where you get that scene, right? Where, okay... So you get the one scene where they're in the hotel hiding out and you get the phone call. They forget because they, they originally, no cell phones allowed, but Aaron brings a cell phone. And to me, I'm kind of confused at this point because I'm thinking to myself like, okay, so obviously this is like Aaron two or Aaron three at this point. I don't even know. <laughs> and, and he knows, like, I don't know if he intentionally brought the cell phone with him. That was kind of a question I had, but I don't, we'll never get an answer for that. And then, so essentially you get that first phone call in the hotel room. And then later on, when it's the doubles of themselves walking around and they've done their stock mark, whatever the day, and they're going into like a coffee shop or a pizza place or something. Yeah. Something, something like that. Some sort of pizza yeah. place. And then they're outside the pizza place and, and Aaron gets the call again. And he, he kind of has this moment where you look back and you're like, he's actually pretending not to know. And, and it's more obvious the second time. It is. Yeah. And then you get, oh, Soon after that, you get the example of the father, right? That goes comatose. And then that's when Abe has the realization that this is effed. And, like, they need to go back and use the fail save. Oh, we haven't discussed the fail we save. We haven't mentioned it. So. <gasps> okay, let's go with that. Okay, so Abe is kind of the initiator of all this stuff. Yeah. Right? Seemingly, he, yeah. In, well, he in is. A way, he is. Yeah. He knew about it first. Exactly. And yeah. he's the one who took it upon himself to create a second box as a failsafe box. Mm -hmm. He hides it in a storage locker. In a second locker storage locker. And um, doesn't, turns tell it on. doesn't tell Aaron about it, right? Right. So it's basically, so obviously it's a failsafe box because he turns it on at a at the point in time where if he needs to, he can go back to that point before he before Aaron knows about anything and so and exactly. he can deal with himself, essentially. Exactly. And yeah, exactly. Tell himself not to not tell to Aaron. Not to do it, mm -hmm. right. Um, doesn't really work out that way. No, because Aaron finds it unbeknownst to Abe and we don't see that scene which is confusing and he and I and we're, we don't until the end yeah you get it at the end where you he do. opens up the door exactly. and he's standing there and you're not really sure which Aaron it is I mean I think it's Aaron it's one. Aaron one it's Aaron one because he doesn't know about it yet but he know he knows what it is yes he knows immediately what Abe's done and and here's my question with that it's like is there an element of like, where does uh, almost something like a deja vu come into play with this? Like, even if he wasn't aware of certain things that himself, his self had done in the future, Ooh. but there's all this crazy <gasps> stuff going on. And you get like an echo of it back or something? Something. Because like, why would he get an inkling to go back to the store? What prompted him to go back there and find it, right? Because he finds a piece of paper that has the second storage locker with abe's name on it right. so he knows that abe has registered the second one and so that's when he goes and flips open the door and sees what he sees which is the second and then that's when he travels back in that fail safe back to the original point that abe set and brings in the original box with him only to set it up his own fail safe that precedes 
Abe's fail safe. So he's got so the upper he hand. He has the upper hand all along, and we don't know that until the very end. By a hair. By literally in a fraction. Because he just messes with um, Abe's fail safe and just sets it back a little bit yeah, further. Just mm-hmm. a tiny bit. Yeah, so he has the upper hand. So that's where I'm getting this whole like very it's, it's a leapfrogging of duplicity and deceit and just these are not Mistrust. friends. Mistrust. No, they're not. They, they are, are not, not friends. No. Not at all. They're professional colleagues that turn into enemies by yeah. the end of this film. <laughs> Yet you're made to, you're like from a social perspective, from a sociologist perspective, like they are, the way they talk to each other is like, at least maybe not like, you know, best buds, but that they obviously grew up a little bit together, like in school at least. At like school. Like school terms, That's what right? I'm assuming. So they their were... banter back yeah. and forth is like something that I could even relate to with like mm-hmm. my friends. Mm-hmm. Not in the uh, terminology and jargon, but yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're friends of convenience. Right. Right? Because they both have professional ambitions. They both have professional abilities, right? And they're in the same field. I would imagine, yeah, they probably went to college together. Yeah. There was their two other friends that they cut out right away, right? And so, again, there's this, this layer of mistrust. And you get this um, yeah. deceitful Aaron giving Abe the key in one scene. And there's all these sort of, like, jabs back and forth, right? Where, like, yeah. that, it could be a subtle jab from Aaron being like, I have the upper hand because this is my property. And I'm giving you a key because I'm privileging you with that. I think so. A yeah. little bit. Bit And then, the again, trip. flip side, Abe, there's one scene where they're talking about how Aaron hasn't let his wife in on the secret. And Aaron, or sorry, Abe makes this comment to Aaron and says, oh, well, when I decided to tell you, like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like this layer of trust, right? And your your wife is outside this layer of trust. But at the same time, that's a jab at Aaron. It's like, it's Abe telling Aaron, I didn't have to tell you about this. Yeah, very true. And that I could take it away, seemingly. Because I don't think that Abe knows that Aaron's aware of the failsafe obviously, box. No, obviously not. Exactly. He thinks he has the upper hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I mm-hmm. didn't really make that connection. And I think, honestly, that ties into the... Um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That ties into their names. Yes. The significance Aaron behind the actual names They're themselves. always at different points along the AB loop. Yeah. So A-A, Aaron, 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 and Abe, Abe, AB, AB. Yes. And you get that at the very end, right? Right before the credits start going up the screen. And it's just, it's A-B-E all together in one um, configuration. It looks like just like a symbol. But if you pull it apart, you'll see A-B-E in it. And right. it's all symbolized as together as if it's simultaneously happening all at once. I almost see that as a metaphor, too, of their personalities, like, not just in terms of, like, what they accomplished or tried to do, but, like, mm. a- a- uh, Abe seemed to be more of, like, not, not like, cut and dry. I don't even know how to describe it. But, like, A to B. Like, yeah. this is what I'm doing. This Then here's this. Mm-hmm. Here's this. More calculated. Mm-hmm. And Aaron was just more, like, flying by the seat of his pants, time travel cowboy, mm. just, like, kind of deciding to do whatever the hell he wanted to do, essentially. Yeah. So he was... I don't even know how I'm really trying to describe this, but, like... I, I get what you're saying though, a, because they're you know, just they're they're they, they represent different aspects along that linear projectile. Sure, yeah, okay, that makes the sense. linear that is curved in on itself. It's linear in sense. the sense that it's always moving in one direction. True, actually, that's a good point. Do you want to get into some important scenes or scenes that we thought were kind of like intriguing? Yeah, because I wanted to bring up one. I haven't mentioned this to you yet, but there is one important moment during, near the beginning of the film. And you see Abe wake up from being basically unconscious on the ground in his room. And it's like this really weird scene. And he wakes up kind of disoriented to a phone call from Aaron. And Aaron says to meet him at the door. And so he goes, he's all like, kind of like, ah. and it was as if he's been drugged, right? Because there's, there's a pattern, right? Every time they go into the real world and want to manipulate something, like we'll see with the shooting in the movie, they drug their double. So I'm considering that Aaron might have drugged Abe or something like that. And maybe he's actually meeting future Aaron in that scene where he meets him at the door and they go into his room and there's this whole awkward thing with like Abe's roommates. You know where they don't even say anything to him? They're just like, okay, let's go there. <laughs> let's just not even bother talking to these people. They're all yeah, that TV. is weird because the 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 part where Abe gasses himself, he says he mm-hmm. s- he stashes him in a closet, yeah. so he wouldn't have woken up unless he stumbled himself out of the closet, and that was some uh. other weird point in time. I just didn't get right? that because he was wasn't a... in bed. He wasn't like it was literally he's on the oh, ground. Oh yeah, that's right because he was sleeping in that scene, so he wouldn't have, he would have been in his PJs. He wouldn't have been in yeah. suit and tie, which he was. He he was yeah he was fully dressed yeah. So it's and just he w- really... he wakes up all like disoriented like yeah. what the hell. That is a bizarre scene, actually, and that's funny that it wasn't really mentioned in some of the breakdowns, actually. 
it that is. scene. Yeah, I haven't actually seen um, that, but I thought that was interesting, so I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, that's cool. A lot of people talk about the, the significance of the party. I feel like, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. It, you can definitely tell the social scientists from the hard science, like, you know, the sciences scientists breakdowns of this film because they emphasize different parts as being significant, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So, like, there's some, like, that one you described as being super duper long, that um, the British, British one. girl. Yeah. Um, she emphasized a lot of the social aspects yeah. of the movie, right? Um, the party being significant and Aaron really wanting to replay that party over and over and over again because he wasn't satisfied with the outcome of the ex- Rachel's ex-boyfriend mm-hmm. showing up with a shotgun. Exactly. Even though he handled it the first time Seemingly. and then better the second time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He still wasn't satisfied, and that was the point where Abe confronts him when they're standing in the fountain. He's, like, pissed because he's realized what Aaron's done. He keeps yeah. on going back, trying to do shit. Yeah, exactly. And now that's where you get this breakdown, again, more breakdown of trust, where they are going back by themselves, right? You get this one moment, where was it? It was, like, in 5 p.m. in the evening or something? And then you get Abe coming over, or no, yeah, Abe goes over to Aaron's house, and it's, like, 3 in the morning, and they say they're going to go back, and it's going to be, like... You know, I don't even know what was going on at that point in the film. <laughs> I'm just going to say, like, outright, like, there were a lot of things that confused me about this film, but um, a lot of things that really intrigued me, too. I what? think another really important moment was the scene, um, it's the moment of the fail-safe loop, when Abe decides to pull the fail-safe and go back to the moment where he goes to originally tell Aaron about, and that's where you get the scene with, Aaron sitting on the park bench, supposedly listening to March Madness. And he's not. And he is not because he has already gone back to his own failsafe point that's previous to Abe's failsafe. He's already started his recording of all the conversations. So what he's actually listening to in the little headphone that Abe hears as he passes out because he's just so out of it from gassing himself and going that far back in time. Yeah. Um, Essentially, he hear, that's, like, the last thing he hears is, like, the conversation replaying. And it's, like... How crazy would that be? Exactly. So then, near after that, you get that scene where they're in the airport, essentially, parting ways. Yeah. Yeah. Before but we even skip before to, we that, get to that, though, yeah. Sorry. Like, okay, what about this part here? Pretty significant, too, and kind of messed up, again, from a, from a psychological perspective, even, in a sense, right? Where... Abe, or sorry, uh, Aaron's talking about this, well, there's this other character we never see called Platt, and he's their right. ex-business partner, yeah. who totally screwed them over and made millions of dollars, right? Yeah. And they're choked at this guy. You never see him. No. And there's this scene at Aaron's house, his wife's in the background in the kitchen, and he's describing how he wants to punch Platt in the face, and then go back in time and tell himself not to do it. And you just see Abe sitting there chewing on his fork, like just not, mm. he's like, I don't like where you're going with this. Mm-hmm. Like, you can see it, because Aaron's laying on his back with, with a beer in his hand, like, looking up at the ceiling, elated at this idea, right? <laughs> and then his wife's like, when are you going to deal with that, with the the rats in the attic or whatever? <laughs> this is a messed up part, really, if you think about it. it I know is. it's yourself, but... But it's fucked. Okay, so at this <laughs> point in time, the Aaron on the couch is clearly obvious. It's not Aaron 1, of course, because Aaron 1 has been drugged and put in the tied attic, up and yeah. put in the attic. Yep. And his wife's like thinks it's rats, and he's yeah. like, "You don't want to kill a bunch of baby birds, do you, sweetie?" Mm-hmm. There's something weird about that. Oh, totally. I and don't even... think I could do that to myself. Oh, I really? don't know. Actually, yeah. That's I mean, a, I would never end up question. in this situation anyway. Like, I, <laughs> I wouldn't even risk it. At I'm not all. smart enough for that. <laughs> like, like th- these guys are ballsy, man. Like, you got a lot to lose. Like, this guy's married. Yeah. You know, you've got a, you've got a. He's I mean, not, not telling a, his a wife. life. Like, what if this goes horribly wrong and you just vanish off the face of the earth? Like, that's a dick move, mm. man. I know that's you're exploring That's classic scientist, news. though. Yeah. Right? A little eccentric, I guess, I suppose. It's classic scientist in the sense that the the discovery is worth the risk, right? But you already the made f- the discovery. Now it's just... Now it's... Well, that's just it, you're though. Walking, like, you're walking the tightrope you across a cliff. Once you discover something, what do you a do ravine, with it? ravine, I should say. I, I'd like to make a little point, though, about Abe in that scene Mm -hmm. when he does make the point after the wife walks away with the laundry or whatever. And he says, we can't do that. And he's like, he basically is trying to put his foot down because exactly what you said, right? He does not like where Abe or Aaron is going with this. Yeah. And in the end, they get exactly that where Abe wants to, because in that scene, right? Aaron or sorry, Abe is posing the question about the millionaire life, like permanent vacation. You got your, your like, 
thousand foot yacht. <laughs> I don't know, it's an exaggeration. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you've yeah. got everything you possibly want in the world. You're traveling around. Foot yacht. I'm sure that's a thing. <laughs> it probably that's is. Definitely a thing. Probably is. But anyways, and how like they're all complaining or not complaining, sorry, they're all saying what they would do with that and how Aaron's wife initially she she is like like Mother Teresa here. Like, come on. She's like Oh, I would have to do something. What would you do the next day when you got home? I'd have to do something useful. I'd have to help people. That's the antithesis of her husband's response to basically the reality of the question that he just posed, right? Pretty much. So basically, he's and getting Aaron, power hungry. He's he getting, is. He's, he's going well, he's power even, tripping a little. It's not even power, but it's like it, it, it is, is though. It is, but because he controls Abe. He knows he controls Abe. And he goes on to control a lot more people, right? Because in the very yeah. last scene, you see him basically running the show with a bunch of engineers and telling them what's up and we need... What did he say? He's like, the whole room. The whole room. And it's like being translated. So he've, he's gone abroad and he is just pursuing this project, I guess, on his own. And Abe has written him off, says, I can't control anything you're going to do, but I'm... Yeah, just never come back. Never do it. Never just yeah and, and it's so funny because like then aaron tries to throw it in abe's face and be like oh yeah well maybe you and your doubles can just go live a whole happy life you just bring your your like his love interest or whatever and you can both have one and because that's that's the complication is that you can't have them both running around you can't be living the same life if you have a double and for me well, maybe you could <laughs> <laughs> let's let, wait, hold on a second sweet. let's talk about this that's for like a the second. ultimate oh my god yeah, you could split your workload oh you could split Everything. I mean, some of it would suck, but at least it's with yourself. It's not like you're splitting it with someone else. You know what I mean? That's true. That's like ultimate identical twin, right? Like, am I going to be upset but the if thing is, myself though, takes you on a date? I know, right? You know That's what, what I, mean? I was thinking. I was like, ooh, what if you have like a girlfriend or something? It's like, <laughs> who's sleeping with who tonight? Right. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Nobody. This could be tricky. <laughs> this is like a, what's it called? Like a polygamous kind of relationship going on here. <laughs> with yourself. But the thing is, though, you don't have the thought. Like, you don't, you don't have connected thoughts. Right. So you're not really connected. You're just literally two physical entities that are identical copies. Okay, but let's talk about that. Though. Because they have different characteristics, let me right? Let's Even Aaron, right? Like he makes the comment when he says, "Oh, the second time he just wanted it more." When he goes to actually like um, try to subdue his double, mm -hmm. but then he gets Aaron too to leave and go to France by basically telling him that his function is like fulfilled, kind of thing, and he just leaves on his own, which is weird, right? I just, the, 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 uh, the premise of that is so messed up. Like you're walking away with all the memories, same memories. Mm -hmm. So you're just all of a sudden gonna be like, well, I guess I'm Aaron three. So you get my wife and family That's and I'm just going to go live in wherever Uzbekistan. That's so weird. Like what? I don't like that. I don't like that. And here's the other thing. It's like, okay, <laughs> are, what? So there's, there's a few paradoxes that happen throughout the movie, but there's, they don't affect anything. Like, there's nothing that happens that's catastrophic, right? Like, there's no, Seemingly. like, hey, we seem... Well, yeah, they're worried about it, but then it kind of goes away. They kind of mm -hmm. end up being worried about other stuff because nothing really bad happens yeah. with those paradoxes. But what would happen if a previous Aaron at this point in time was then killed? Right? Like, what, happen what happens if Aaron 2 over in France gets hit by a bus? And or, Aaron whoever else that's ex that's still in existence? Question, like, like, how does that come into play? Also, hmm. you were talking about, yeah, like, are these physical? I mean, they're clearly physical bot. Like, they're, they are yeah. the same person. It is a the same body, the same heart. Mm -hmm. Like, is it, it connected? Is it literally beating at the same pulses? Like, that's I don't just even it. No, like, Would what the is body, the physical manifestation ooh, of this? Would the body literally go on the exact same projectile? So, if, say, Aaron 1 gets cancer at age 47, will Aaron 2 get cancer at age 47? Or will the environmental differences kind of come up with a different conclusion? That is a crazy question because that, yeah, totally. They'd be in different environments, different exposures, different risks, and now different time, f different, different paths. So are they different, in different diverging universes? Diverging timelines. Is this different universes then? Or is it's this... almost like, yeah, it's, it is, it is almost. It's existing, you, it's, it, they're not parallel because they are existing simultaneously in the same space. 
Yeah. This gets into weird areas of metaphysics that is so far beyond us that I can't even, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even like rationalize it in a way that would just be like, you know, like bar room talk, like, you know, like talking about it at the bar. Like I can't rationalize it. I, I cannot put you know what it this into reminds words. You of? Andrew, this reminds me of when we were first introduced to Foucault. <laughs> oh my God. Well, we, I, we wrapped our heads around that a little bit better. Uh, I feel like if I had opened up that book again, I probably wouldn't understand anything. Yes, you would. <laughs> well, maybe. But. We okay, write. fine. I'm, I'm kind of just, yeah. But well, I, we only ever me read, I mean, the order of things was only one of many of his works. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we focused on. I feel like that honestly applies to this even, potentially, right? Oh, I Because what is one real and what, is, what manifests as reality and, Ooh. you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm thinking of, what is that called? The Panopticon of the Prison. I think I read that by him too. That was that was brilliant. But totally. Anyways. Hey, maybe there's even parallels to. Huh, we should like get somebody on that. We should go back to university and try to find somebody to like be an authority on this possible parallels here. But I mean, what about the? We didn't mention the bleeding in the ear. Oh yeah. Right. So there's the physical effects. Mm -hmm. So Aaron ends up bleeding from his ear like for a while. He's got like a towel up there, and it is covered in blood. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, I'll have a little more wine as well. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> we are enjoying uh, Border Town. Shout out to uh, Folklore on the Rocks. And uh, we are actually enjoying the Living Ooh. Desert Red 2015. There you go. It is a blend of, oh, Cabernet Franc, <laughs> Cab Sauvignon, and Merlot. It makes 14%. Film Friday just, well, Film Saturday just that much better. It's so smooth and delicious. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> physical effects. So Aaron's bleeding from the ear. They have the guy who they believe is on to them that they end up finding passed out on the ground, yet Abe phones him and he's chilling in his apartment. Right, so he's other, got a double. Right, so he's clearly figured it out. And then there was one other thing. The cell to... phones? That was the one other thing, I think. Yeah, like one, one other like physical effect, I'm trying to remember. Oh, sorry, physical effects, the handwriting. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. So they found that as they were doing this over and over and over again, all of a sudden they were realizing... Not their original Abe and Aaron's, but the others, essentially, as the, the ones and twos and mores as they were going on here and doubling, mm -hmm. couldn't write. Like, they would try, it was almost like they had a brain injury in a way, right? So it's like, you you know what you're trying to write, but you go to write it, and it just doesn't translate. You no. cannot put it in on a page, and they showed it, and it was like, you know, like a one-year-old, like, with, like, mm -hmm. fake letters. Well, he makes a There's comment like where it's there, like... and then it's just a bunch of nothing. Yeah, he makes a comment where, um, essentially, the left is as good as the right. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is that all about? What, what is that? What's up with that? You, uh, you uh, tell me. Well, is there an actual, like, neurological effect that is, like, p like, messing with them from doing this over and over and over again? Or is it that, literally, like, where they are existing in time, and where they're I don't even know, their minds or their souls or whatever else is, is just a hair off. Mm. And so what they're thinking and trying to translate doesn't in the actual timeline that their hand is writing on the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. There's, their physical, it's almost like, um, it, you can almost draw parallels to um, that movie with um, Natalie Portman too. What was that one we watched? Annihilation. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where it's almost like their cellular, their, their actual construction is like off from going through this over and over and over again. You... Yeah, you would have to imagine that there has to be some sort of physical consequence to to this defiance of the laws of physics. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, is this movie is just a total freaking mind bender to me. Yeah, totally. Was right. there anything else you really wanted to touch on before it wraps up? Or I don't even know. No, not really. I think that's about all I can say. I mean, I could go much. on. We could go on for days. But I honestly think that this is good. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So thank you guys so much for listening to another Film Friday and a shout out to Matthew Plum for the suggestion. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Yeah. As always, thank you so much to our producer, Charlene Ramler, yes. and to all of our lovely patrons over in our Patreon community. Absolutely. Um, you guys keep the lights on around here and we appreciate you. We really, really do. And we really... Uh, yeah. And all our listeners. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. So until tomorrow's release... That's right. We will see you then. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>
was a podcast from the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.